Wow, I can see how this lipstick looks on camera. I'm not 100% feeling it at all, but I thought I'd wear it because I was trying to channel Chris and Chris, as well as Sam from Drug. They really like wearing a uh, bold lipstick like this, so I I thought I'd try. I thought I'd try it. I'm just seeing so much blue in the viewfinder. So, as I mentioned previously in my other Scum Espana Season 2 discussion videos, I meant to discuss the entire season, but then I ended up speaking for two hours, and it was way too long to be one video, so I decided to chop it up. And in trying to do this review of the entire season in one go, I completely skipped out on episode six, you know, like the fluffy episode. So I thought I'd just film this video, just really talking about all of the nice fluffy bits, bring some positivity in our lives, especially since there's so much negativity going around with season three. This episode functions more as like the extended honeymoon period. In this episode, we get them cuddling in bed, which is from episode five of the original. We get the cheese toasty scene, which is from episode two of the original. We have Chris introducing Joanna to all of her friends and coming out to them. That happens in episode eight of the original. But the main thing is that this is an episode where Joanna is in all of the clips and most of the clips are happy and positive. So it's like episode eight in that way where everything's happy then we get the introduction of Hell Week. And I really, really like this introduction of Hell Week because it is the most unique introduction of Hell Week. Every time I glance at the viewfinder I'm just seeing a bunch of blue right here. I feel like this is not gonna be regular for me. Hell Week doesn't begin with Joanna texting Chris saying that she needed space. It doesn't begin with her kissing Eloy. She did that for the very last time in the last episode. It ends when she just disappears out of nowhere and Chris doesn't know how to get a hold of her. She's not answering her text. She's not going to school. I really like this conversation that she has with her friends in episode seven where she says, I don't know anything about her. I don't know where she lives. I don't know where she went to school before. I think it's interesting that she had that conversation with her friends because the same is true for all of the other Esocs, but it bothers there's Chris more and Joanna is the Evan that we get to know the most. Now since I was able to contextualize this episode, episode 6, as the extended honeymoon period, when I looked back at episode 5 I was like, okay there's some elements of episode 7 within this episode. So Chris has a conversation with Amira. She doesn't know what's going on with Joanna. Amira was there when Chris saw Joanna kiss her boyfriend. She was like, she's playing me hot and cold. I thought we were gonna be together. And then she goes back with her boyfriend. What's going on? Amira said that you never know what's going on in somebody else's head and that's why it's important not to judge them. And it reminded me of what Nora has in her bedroom. Everybody is fighting a battle you don't know about. Be kind always. Yeah, so it was the Spanish version of that. Also, this scene is like the Spanish version of this scene where the boys are all talking to Isak, all giving him advice, saying that Isak should just give Evan an ultimate ultimatum like if you want to be with me dump your girlfriend so then this scene forgive me it's their reunion scene i'd say one of my favorite things about joanna and chris she doesn't let joanna off easily joanna wants to give her attention and chris is just not having it she sends her that note chris rips it up i really like the caption there big dick energy for sure. She doesn't just show up and all is forgiven. Chris calls her out, asks, how do I know that you're not gonna change your mind again? Maybe I wanna kinda work for that forgiveness, you know what I'm saying? In the first clip of this episode, I really like how Amira is just looking at Joanna and Chris interacting and she's like, what's going on here? There's gonna be a long weekend coming up. Chris's plans are to go back to her hometown, meet up with her other brothers there, but Joanna said, oh, you could also spend the long weekend with me. Chris is like, hell yes. She pretends to be sick. <laughs> 
have to say, I really like that the characters in this story, they have families. These can't just bring Joanna over to spend the night like it's nothing. Like the other Aesops were able to do. She has to work around having a family, so that means lying about being sick so that she could stay home all weekend. And then Joanna's mom keeps calling her and asking what's going on, and she told her mom already that she's sleeping over at a friend's house. I feel like it's a lot more realistic or a lot more relatable when the teenage characters have parents. They have to lie to their parents in order to spend the night or spend several nights with their significant others. But anyway, I liked the cuddling in bed scene. Of course, I like all of the cuddling in bed scenes. It's so intimate, you know, and there's a good mix of cute banter and them just cuddling and kissing and just being together, but also they talk and then you learn more about the Evan characters. Chris was talking about their interaction at school and she was sorry for just leaving her to talk to her friends and she doesn't know how to tell her friends about their relationship. Joanna's like, oh, I thought that you were going to introduce me to your entire family by now. One of the things that I really liked about the original Evic, as well as with many of the other Evics, is there's more patience when it comes to coming out. They're not like, okay, now that we're together, you have to tell everyone. And if you don't tell everybody, and if you don't come out publicly, on my terms and not on your terms. We're over, you must not really love me, et cetera, et cetera. I've seen that in other coming out stories and I really hate it every time it happens. I cannot stand it. Joanna talks about her experience with friends. I think it's very interesting that the Evan characters don't really have friends and then once Isak and Evan get together, like Evan, gets absorbed into Aesop's group of friends when he never really had his own friends. Of course, in the original version, we see him with like some extras who are supposed to be his friends, but Aesop never forms a relationship with those people and we don't really learn more about them. We just see Evan with them once or twice. But with Joanna, it sounds like she's been betrayed by friends. Maybe she's had some fair weather friends who don't stick with her through the fucking worst. I think it'd be interesting if they develop that more throughout the seasons. Chris asks about Joanna's necklace that she always wears and at the end of the episode Joanna gives her necklace to Chris and Chris doesn't accept it because it's like too serious or whatever. We never get an explanation of why that necklace is important. We have the cheese toasty scene. I like how Joanna and Chris like they kiss each other all around the face. It reminds me of the Adams family when Gomez would kiss Morticia all up the arm. I don't know I like that they have their own unique way of showing affection that, you know, some of the other couples don't have. I feel like that helps set them apart, you know? Chris decides that she wants to throw a party. I would like to point out, last season, the boy squad and the girl squad, they were all talking about how they didn't have plans for the weekend. Nora mentions casually that her parents aren't going to be home, and then Chris is like, there we go, we're going to have a party at your house. And all of her friends join in, they're like, Nora, Nora. Nora. And we hear that Nora. 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 Again, in this episode, right before Nora starts singing karaoke. But we also hear it again in season three, right before Nora starts singing Bad Guy. I don't know. I think that it's interesting in all three of the seasons we've all had Nora. Nora. In this episode, we get the more than words scene where she sings a Billie Eilish song, not direct to Alejandro. She doesn't even look at him, but he's looking at her. And you can see Lucas and Viri, like they start off very happy, but then they like both come to the realization that, oh, something's happening here. There's a contrast between that and in season three where she's singing Bad Guy to Mikel. It's like the dark version of More Than Words, you know? Anyway, Back in season one, when it was Chris's idea that Nora should be the one to throw a party since her parents aren't going to be home, Nora said, yes, on one condition, it's not going to be some crazy party. It's just going to be you guys. And then Chris ended up inviting everybody and that freaked Nora out. Her parents got really mad at her. They took her phone away as punishment. And I don't know if Chris ever apologized for that. So Nora just wanted 
a small gathering of her closest friends and then when it's Chris's turn to throw a party at her place while her parents aren't there for the weekend, she only invites her closest friends. She doesn't invite the entire fucking school. So if I were Nora, I would be pissed. Oh, you know how to have a party with just a couple of people and not with everybody at our school? But you know who did not show up? It appears that uh, our friend over here who's very enthusiastic about his mom's cooking, the Corviches. We did not get any Corviches at that party. We did not get him. We got the Spanish girl squad, Lucas, Alejandro, and Ines. My girl, Ines, I love her so much. She's like the best Ingrid. Ines and Eva made up at the end of season one, and I was really excited when I saw the characters. They were at the women's march together. I keep saying the women's march. They were at a women's march, AM, on International Women's Day. I saw a lot of pictures from Instagram. I'm like, oh, hey, Ines was with them. She went with them too, that's so cool. The boy squad, they also showed up at the march. There were a lot of people there though. Alejandro was not present, but the reason why Alejandro was at this party was because he was dating Ines. That was revealed in the last episode. Reading comments for season two are a lot more fun than reading the YouTube comments for season three. I do want to touch on these two YouTube comments that I read because I feel like it's very interesting and I have a lot to say about it, but I have so much to say that <laughs> I'm gonna need to take a break and then come back later. So expect a wardrobe change and then I will launch into my full discussion on these two things. Hello there internet, it is a few weeks later and we shall now talk on the subject of male and female friendships. There's a scene in the original season three when Isak is at the nurse's office at school and he's all by himself and I saw somebody on Tumblr compare and contrast an image of him sitting by himself at the nurse's office and compare that to when Vild was at the nurse's office and she was surrounded by all of her friends. And then they went on to talk about the differences between men and women, how men tend to feel more isolated, they're less likely to talk about their feelings or share their feelings, and then they just bottle up their emotions deep within themselves and then they don't like leads them feeling very confined, feeling very aggressive. So one of the good things about season three being about a male character as opposed to it being about a female character is that we see this male character talk with his friends, interact with his friends, come out to his friends and have his friends be supportive of him. And I thought to myself, yeah, that isolation that Isak is feeling, it definitely makes sense when you think about gender differences between men and women. And I thought that way until season four started airing and I saw that Sana was so much more isolated than Isak was and she got significantly less support from her group of friends and I kept on thinking to myself, I wish that Sana got the love and support that Isak got from his group of friends. Even though with Isak's group of friends, I liked them from episode six onward. But before episode six, I had some problems with them. So with Isak, there was no boy squad until the beginning of season three. Before that, it was just Jonas and Elias. Jonas said some homophobic things. Elias said some homophobic things in season one. They bothered Isak, but Jonas's response was just have a sense of humor. And then in season three, one week before Isak is called out for being homophobic, he tells Emma that he doesn't want to go to a party with her. He already has plans. Madi accepts for him and then asks if he's gay. And this is completely ignored. Nobody calls it out. And I really don't like that we see this homophobia directed towards Isak and nobody cares, nobody calls it out, it's never criticized, but as soon as he starts internalizing that and saying homophobic shit himself, that's when it gets called out. Scum Espana did things a little bit differently. They introduced the boy squad in the second clip of the entire show. So they were there from the very beginning of season one. They don't make fun of him for being gay and when they went to that cabin trip, Lucas came along because he was having trouble at 
home. And then his other friends decided to join in because they wanted to be supportive of Lucas because he was having trouble at home and they never make fun of him for being gay. So this guy had such supportive friends that he came out way earlier than the original Isak did. And then we got to have this season with a female character. So I like that with Scum Espana, we do get to see the male gay character be supported by his straight male friends. But then we also get to see a love story between two girls, which we didn't get a chance to see before. So when I watched season three originally, I did not think to myself, mm, this storyline should be with a girl and not with a guy. The other two seasons were about girls because I didn't know that the original plan was for the show to be about all of the characters in the girl squad, but then have the gay storyline be with a guy who's not even in that friend group. As I mentioned before, I thought that Vilda gave me a lot of gay vibes and I thought that we were gonna expand on that later on. I thought that we might get a gay female character at some point in the show anyway. Why did Vilda give me gay vibes? Well, one, I never really bought that she was actually interested in William. I didn't buy that she was sexually attracted to William. She was, of course, obsessed with William, but I thought of that as like she was obsessed with his status. She was obsessed with his popularity, and she was obsessed with how associating with him could elevate her social status, you know? And there was also the little incident when she made out with Eva and then later downplayed the fact that she felt turned on by that. So I thought that that was very interesting. I think that that's a very big difference between homosexuality or sexuality in general between men and women. When you're a woman, it's like socially acceptable for you to make out with other girls at parties and it's not taken seriously. Like, oh, you might actually be sexually attracted to that other woman. In season one, Eva and Jorge turned around and they saw Chris make out with a girl at Alejandro's party. And when they saw that, Jorge was like, oh wow, Chris is super wasted. And then it was like, yeah, she must be a little drunk. If they had turned around and saw Lucas making out with some guy, do you think they would have had that reaction? No, they would have been like, um, I think that Lucas is gay. When Lucas comes out to Eva, her reaction is to basically say, yeah, okay. Actually, Jorge and I had discussed this. We guessed if that's maybe why you weren't interested in any girls. That didn't come completely out of left field for them, even though they never saw him make out with a guy or flirt with a guy or do anything with a guy. Meanwhile, Eva saw Chris make out with a girl and her mind never went to the possibility of, oh, maybe Chris is actually bisexual. Maybe she's a lesbian. Who knows? And then in this episode, Chris tells the girls that she's going out with Joanna and Eva is completely shocked, even though of all of the girls, she must have had some indication, some clue. So I think that that was very interesting. Now, as you guys might already know, this is also the episode where we get this infamous bit of dialogue, which I've already covered in another video called Is My Favorite Scum Remake Problematic? Question mark, question mark. I did get a couple of comments saying that there's more to the story since I didn't comment at all on Twitter. I have this whole other thing about Twitter. I just don't. Also, there's no need to worry about sounding aggressive. It's completely fine if you don't 100% agree with me or if you completely disagree with me altogether. I'm not going to take it as a personal attack. Now, sometimes people comment on my videos and then YouTube deletes the comments and I swear to God, that's YouTube. That's not me. I'm not going around thinking, oh, I don't know how to respond to that comment and I don't like it, so I'm just gonna delete it just because of that. No, if you're not posting like spam, you're not posting anything like overtly hateful, I'm not gonna just delete your comment just because I disagree with it. But anyway, why didn't I even mention Twitter? I should have made it more clear in that other video that there's so many angles 
through which you could talk about this specific controversy. We could talk about, like, within the scum fandom, there's, like, scum fandom versus scum fandom. Like, oh, you like the panphobic version. You like the racist one. You like the sexist one. You like the lesbophobic one. And there's, like, a lot of infighting because of that. We're not actually talking about why things are problematic and what we can do to make it better. We could talk about the website of Twitter, how it doesn't really allow for nuance. It doesn't allow for deep discussion. I mean, we could also talk about celebrity culture, how people put celebrities on really high pedestals if they appear to support your worldview, but as soon as it turns out that they don't, canceled. And how this is justified even if somebody is really young, if they are a fucking teenager, because we have this idea that they have all of this power and we, the people, have none, even though we have a lot of power when we collectivize in groups. We could talk about social justice and education, and should education, does it have to follow the banking method. Anyway, I didn't want to talk about why everybody else is offended. I just wanted to talk about why it's not a deal breaker for me. I am far more likely to criticize a show that was written by grown-ups who make content for teenagers and that content is problematic. I'm much more likely to criticize them than I am to criticize a 16 year old or a 17 year old who went on Twitter and just talked about things from their perspective, who came to a conclusion based off of the information that they had available to them at that point in time. Of the tweets, this one was the most important. He says that his opinion isn't 100% right. He acknowledges that he could be wrong. Does that cover it? I, uh, I don't know. Actually, I'd say the most problematic content of this episode had to be this little bit with Eva right here. She did that two other times this season where as soon as something gets a little bit controversial, she's like, no, no, let's not talk about this. And I feel like that's part of the problem. When it comes to controversy, there's two main ways that people deal with it. Either be very conflict avoidant, let's just sweep that shit right under the rug, not talk about it at all, or let's talk about it, let's completely polarize each other, let's be super aggressive, super mean, super abusive about it, let's escalate the conflicts rather than try to solve the conflict. Anyway, back to the TV show. So as I said, Hell Week started in the next clip, and I'm really glad that before all of that happened, she came out to her friends, so then her friends were there to support her during the worst of times. So that is what I have to say about Scum Espania, episode six. Hi, there is a possibility that I might take a break from talking about Scum Espania because I'm starting to feel that scum video making burnouts where I've been making a lot of videos about the same topic for a while and I kind of want to switch things up for a minute, so.